Welcome to this video seminar all about Mikhail Bakhtin's carnivalesque theory. I'll be really deliberately aiming this video towards literature study, um, aimed really at A-level students, but this video could be useful to anybody who is referring to the carnivalesque as part of any kind of studies. So this video is going to be split into four main sections. Um, I'm going to be talking about where the uh, the carnivalesque theory comes from in terms of its relationship with Lent. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the aspects of the carnivalesque that we often find in literature uh, to give some modern day examples of the carnivalesque as well, and then finish off with just a very simple summary of what I have discussed in this video. So as to the origins of uh, carnival, uh, carnival in medieval culture uh, was the only time in a year where the peasants uh, could party, could revel and carouse uh, if they were going to be working hard for the rest of the year. Um, it was traditionally a time that happened just before Lent in February and March. And during Lent, many gave up um, extravagant foods or luxury foods which contained sugar or meat uh, and other foods and drinks. So the carnival um, and would, would be the last opportunity really for the people to enjoy these treats before fasting began. It was often a time of partying and dancing and it was a time to throw off the shackles of our responsibilities and our serious lives. And, and that links to, uh, we continue to do that, um, all of us, um, even in modern day, which I'll talk about in a minute. So a good example is Mardi Gras, um, which is French for Fat Tuesday, uh, for example, which, which happens in New Orleans, um, but happens actually in many places across the world, um, which was a day where um, fat um, and other luxurious goods were eaten um, on Shrove Tuesday, which is sometimes called, at least in the UK, Pancake Day. So it was a, it was a time of eating up all the food before um, Lent. It could last for two weeks and it would often involve uh, street parties and decorations. In fact, as I'm uh, recording this video today, uh, the um, Australian version of Mardi Gras is on the news. So it's something that we have still in modern culture, which stems right back to medieval times. So in terms of literature, um, what kind of aspects do we find in carnivalesque literature? Well, some of them, and, and I think the main ones, are these. So in order for a writer to be writing in a very carnivalesque fashion, they need to be demonstrating a certain power of the imagination. And this might be closely linked, to, for example, to surrealism, uh, quite elaborate description, uh, quite artistic imagery, and also um, magic realism as well. And in so doing, it creates an exuberant and energetic narrative, which really goes against what we expect maybe from the opposite of magic realism, which might be social realism, which is where everything represents real life. It was a time, like we've said, of unrestrained festivity and revelry, which means that whenever there is a party atmosphere, chances are there is a degree of carnivalesque going on. And the carnivalesque in literature also rejects the normal rules, just as its medieval origins would. So this was a day or a time when existing or traditional hierarchies were inverted or um, turned on their head. So, for example, servants or peasants can become masters for the day and vice versa. In carnivalesque literature, there's often an embracing of disorder, chaos, fragmentation and rule breaking. And to break the rules is not seen as anything um, to be stigmatised over. There's no taboo about it. There's no sense of consequence. Uh, and it's all part of throwing off um, our regular lives. Sometimes characters can be mischievous and playful uh, and it creates as well a carefree and irreverent attitude where serious issues uh, are not seen as so serious, at least for a temp temporary period of time. Sometimes there's a, there's a degree of crudeness to it and a degree of lewdness to it. So, for example, there might be a focus on both bodily functions and there might be references to sex. And it makes unacceptable behaviour acceptable because that's all part of this inversion of normality. Sometimes characters can cross-dress, they can disguise. And as you can see from the images on the right-hand side, two of those images features elaborate costumes that you wouldn't really wear um, other than if you were taking part in some kind of party or carnival. 
And perhaps one of the reasons why uh, parties and carnivals are so popular is because we know they're temporary. They don't last forever. And the next day they might be disappeared and gone. So you may have to make sure that you make the most of it while you can. So those are the main ingredients that we find in carnivalesque literature. In terms of modern day examples and, you know, the carnivalesque mood, let's say, is not just restricted to literature because we can find it in all of our lives, in the things that we choose to do every year. So all of these things also involve a degree of party atmosphere, as well as a degree of throwing off our normal lives. As humans, we're quite bad at being serious all of the time. Uh, it actually leads us to feel quite miserable if we don't find anything to enjoy in our lives. So what we do as humans is we spend our own hard-earned money on these kind of things because we place so much value on escaping normal life and having some fun. And of course, there are lots of things that you see uh, at these kind of events that you would not probably see in, in quotes, normal life. So it's acceptable, for example, in a stag do, to tape your best friend to a lamppost in the nude. You wouldn't do that in regular life because you know it's wrong to do it, but in a stag do, people do. So there's lots of examples here of cross-dressing, lots of examples of disguise being used, and lots of examples of how we desire as humans to escape our serious lives temporarily to have a bit of fun. And a lot of the time in a carnivalesque text or a text that features the carnivalesque atmosphere, there will be parties or events which characters uh, attend, which gives them an opportunity to break the rules and also escape the regularity of their normal lives. To finish off this short guide to the carnivalesque, I've just really um, summarised the, the main kind of ingredients that we see in the hope that you would be able to spot this easily in a text that you are reading or studying, but also maybe in a film that you're watching. So it just basically um, shortens the previous slide that I showed you. So everything here to do with rules and hierarchy in the um, with the aim of having festivity and also a degree of mischief, because as humans, we ascribe value to these things in order to escape our normal lives. So that is a short introduction to the carnivalesque with the main things to look out for if you're studying a novel uh, or a piece of literature which you want to link the Karnvalesk theory to. This is, of course, from the Russian philosopher and literary critic, Mukhail Bakhtin, who really coined this theory around the time of the Second World War. So in, compared to other theories in literature, um, it's not particularly old. Uh, it's still um, within, a, you know, within the last century. So thank you very much for watching. Hopefully that was useful and good luck in your studies. Thank you.